Good morning. I'm Jason Ponton. I am a senior partner at Flagship Pioneering in the United States. I've done a bunch of things in my uh, lifetime. I was the editor of Red Herring magazine. I worked at MIT for many years where I was both the editor-in-chief and the publisher of MIT Technology Review. Uh, I launched a MIT initiative called Solve, which seeks to crowdsource extraordinary solutions to great global problems. And now I work as a investor, essentially, but at a rather unusual firm. We select maybe a hundred unprecedented, unlikely ideas a year that we think might have extraordinary social value. And of those hundred ideas, if we think that they might have some testable scientific hypothesis, and if we think that they have economic opportunity, we throw them into the lab for two or three years. If they can demonstrate that their scientific hypothesis works, we start to shower them with money, and they become standalone businesses. Last year, we were responsible for around four of the largest IPOs in the life sciences industry. I am extraordinarily happy to be here in Poland today. It is my first time in your country, but I wish all success to our friends at ICANN and to MIT Sloan in what I'm sure is going to be a extraordinarily profitable joint venture. Today, I'm going to talk to you about 10 technologies that I think are genuine breakthroughs. Breakthroughs that have enormous economic potential uh, that will be the basis of trillion dollar industries, but which are also so powerful that they have the capacity for both great economic and social good, but also are in some cases troubling or could be used for other purposes. Um, we won't have any time for questions, but afterwards I'd be very happy to talk to you about some of the reasons why you as concerned citizens need to be involved in defining the future direction of these technologies. In each case, for each technology, I'm going to try and describe to you what the breakthrough is. I'll explain to you why I think that breakthrough is important. I'll tell you who the people you should look at to understand uh, who is leading the innovation. Uh, and then finally, I might suggest how long it will be before the technology will enter the marketplace. Some of these technologies are in use right now. Some might take one, two, three years, or might take decades to fully build out as commercial applications. But unlike how, which you saw a few moments ago, none of these technologies are science fictional. They're based upon science fact. They're based on the kinds of breakthroughs that firms like Flagship are, are working on every day. So I'm going to begin by talking about what I think is amongst the most transformative technologies of my lifetime, which is the breakthrough in artificial intelligence and machine learning. If you had asked me in 2010 whether or not artificial intelligence was going to be a large-scale business application, I would have rolled my eyes at you. Artificial intelligence, which actually predates the creation of uh, working computers, existed for decades in what scientists called the AI deep winter. Very little progress was made at all. And then in 2012, there was this absolute explosion, this extraordinary breakthrough from a gentleman called Jeff Hinton at the University of Toronto. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about what that breakthrough was and why it was so powerful, and yet how limited it is. If you, if you don't work in AI and you're not actually involved in its development, it's very easy to be overwhelmed by the hype. And though the innovations date back to an idea sketched in that formula, which are called perceptrons, 
which is a way of building computers loosely based upon the neural network in your own brain, those innovations weren't reality until quite recently. And yet, recently the hype could not be larger. Andrew Ng, who is one of the principal promoters uh, and developers of AI, says that if a typical person can do a mental task with less than one second of thought, we can probably automate it using AI, either now or in the future. Sundar Pichai, who is the CEO of Google, has likened modern AI and machine learning to electricity or even to reading. Venture capitalists like me are investing around $4.5 billion a year right now on this narrow area of AI and machine learning. Um, a common conversation I have at Flagship is how much it will cost to hire an AI or machine learning expert. I was talking to one of my peers on the partnership and he described the following person. He said, um, I want an AI expert who has a recently created AI PhD, ideally from MIT or Caltech or, or Stanford. That person should have worked on large data sets uh, in biology uh, and they should be familiar with some recent techniques, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. I said, Avak, that was his name, how much does that person cost? Oh, he says, oh, at least $500,000 a year in salary and probably a couple of million dollars a year uh, in compensation in stock. So money is showering into this area. The areas where machine learning has the most potential are fairly specific. They are industries that produce enormous amounts of data. But those data-rich industries are across, across industry in the economy. They're in agriculture, finance, automotive, healthcare, and telecom. One of the messages I want to leave with you is there is not a single part of the economy that will not be in some way affected by this revolution in machine learning. So what is the innovation? Well, if I can leave you with one takeaway, it's that modern AI is in fact a very narrow breakthrough called deep learning. And all deep learning is, is math. Those of you who did calculus back at school will know the technique. It's based upon gradient analysis. A deep learning system loosely based upon the, the blooming connections in your own brain works very simply. There are a series of inputs and outputs, and these inputs and outputs are trained upon a series of neural nodes that statistically weight the capacity to recognize the input with the output. And the, the data upon which the machine learning is trained is called the data training set. And the algorithm that was used was invented by the gentleman I just mentioned, mentioned at the University of Toronto called Jeff Hinton. The big breakthrough came in 2012, and it was really two things. It was more powerful algorithms and the use of more powerful processing systems, largely from the gaming industry. But deep learning, though it is extremely powerful at one thing, is remarkably weak at other things. What deep learning can do is a form of pattern recognition. It's very good at seeing how one thing is like another thing. But almost all the interesting problems in life turn out not to be classification problems. And certainly most of the problems in business aren't classification problems. So that's my daughter. Her name is Ada. Um, Ada is named after Ada because she was born on Ada Lovelace Day. Uh, Ada Lovelace was the first computer programmer, the daughter of Lord Byron, the English poet. Whatever Ada is doing to learn isn't machine learning. So to teach a machine learning system to understand anything, you have to expose it to literally millions or at least billions of instances of a thing. So I can show a machine learning system uh, images of a hot dog. 
And if I show the machine learning system enough images of a hot dog, it will reliably identify a hot dog in any photograph. But that's not how Ada learns. Ada is learning in some other way. You can show Ada a hot dog and a sandwich and a piece of sushi, and she will somehow intuit that they are the same thing, and she'll learn from only seeing a sandwich once. And you can e even teach a four-year-old how to make a sandwich, and she'll do it very interesting. And that's because Ada has inbuilt systems. Ada recognizes the world. She knows that the world has rules, and she has some kind of a mechanism to learn. So whatever machine learning systems are doing, they're not learning like my, my daughter. So deep learning's limitations can be fairly easily summarized. Deep learning is easily fooled. So if you go and show a deep learning something from outside the training set, it often won't recognize it, and it will break. The amount of data that you have to expose a, a deep learning system to is very large. And that means at the moment that deep learning is mainly profiting industries that are productive of lots of data. Extraordinarily at the moment, most deep learning systems also require uh, supervised learning by human instructors. This always surprises people from outside the field of artificial intelligence. There is a program called Google Translate, which is now more reliable at certain types of language-to-language -language translation uh, than human translators are. Uh, Google Translate has a higher accuracy rate, for instance, from English to Mandarin and Mandarin back into English. But to train Google Translate to do that, human linguists, around 200 of them at Google, had to go and identify individual phonemes in English and Mandarin in order to train the system. And that's both very expensive and very time consuming. And finally, deep learning isn't creative. It has no theory of the world or of mind. Gary Marcus, who is a professor at NYU uh, and the former head of AI at Uber, says that deep learning is greedle, greedy, brittle, opaque, and shallow by which he means that it wants a lot of data, it easily breaks, we don't really understand how it works, and it's not very creative of fresh insights. And deep learning's extraordinary limitations have real business uh, applications as well. It has real limitations upon what we will one day use deep learning for. Um, so for instance, uh, despite all the hype around self-driving cars, Self-driving cars only work well when the streets have been thoroughly mapped, uh, when it's sunny, when it's not night, when it's not raining. So uh, self-driving cars work great in Palo Alto or with Google Cars, but you couldn't easily go and put a self-driving car uh, in Beijing uh, and expect it to work. And 90% reliability simply isn't good enough uh, for a level four self-driving car. So I asked three of the biggest experts, um, uh, forgive me, four, in artificial intelligence, what the three biggest trends in AI for 2019 to. This was Andrew Ng, who I introduced you to, uh, who was the creator of Google Mind, Jan LeCun, who is head of intelligence at uh, Facebook and who created a technique called convolutional neural nets upon which all modern deep learning is based. Eric Horvitz, who is head of Microsoft Research, uh, and Pedro Dominguez, who is a professor at the University of Washington. Uh, and these were their three big trends for me for AI in 2019. The first was a technique called generative adversarial networks. And generative adversarial networks is a profound and game-changing breakthrough in the limitations in deep learning. I won't go into the math, but GANs essentially allow deep learning systems to generate their own data so that deep learning systems no longer have to be supervised. They no longer require human instructors. 
And this has created a almost spooky breakthrough uh, in the last couple of years. GANs can teach systems how to go and learn. So uh, last year, uh, a company called DeepMind in London taught a deep learning system using GANs to learn how to play the game Go in 14 hours and then to beat any human player. So for the first time, we're creating systems uh, that can teach themselves without any prior instruction and without any human intervention. And these systems can now become more powerful than any human being. The other breakthrough, which I think is profoundly important, is AI is now beginning to be applied every day to real industrial applications beyond uh, the types of consumer applications that internet companies like Google and Facebook used. Uh, just in my own field of biotech, uh, all the companies we have created this year, all nine of them, are using generative adversarial networks to go and do fundamental drug discovery. And we've discovered something absolutely uh, shocking. Uh, using deep learning, we can use our systems to make scientific hypotheses that elude us. Biology is incredibly complicated. And we tell ourselves just so stories. Our systems are now proposing fundamental biological insights that we don't fully understand. And this is happening in a whole variety of industries. Uh, there's a company in the United States, Salesforce, one of the partners today, who has a program called Einstein that is even helping business decision makers to make better business decisions. Uh, it will look at the decisions that you're making and say, well, have you thought about doing X or Y? And they're often fairly good suggestions. I think the other big breakthrough in 2019 is that a large number of IT companies are moving these AI applications into the cloud. So you heard me say earlier that when we want to go and hire an AI expert, that can cost up to half a million dollars a year in compensation. And that is simply too expensive for many small and medium-sized enterprises. If AI is to truly be transformative to businesses like the people in the room, it has to be a service that you can consume in the cloud. So Amazon is offering that through AWS. Google has a program called TensorFlow. IBM also has an AI-based system in the cloud. And the idea is that any business can rent it, just like you rent processing power or uh, data storage now to help yourself make better decisions. There are some problems in AI, though, that we fundamentally still don't understand and which I think have profound uh, social implications and that everyone who is a leader in a business or just a concerned citizen needs to think through. Um, at the moment, almost all the data that is being generated is owned by a few very large companies in the United States, often in Silicon Valley. Um, I have misgivings about this kind of data monopoly owned by Adobe, by Amazon, by Google, uh, by a very small number of firms. Uh, and I think that it has both privacy concerns and competitive pressures as well. A curious feature about all artificial intelligence systems is they are black boxes. And, and let me explain what that means. When you debug a formal uh, program system, you can pretty much understand why that system is performing the way it does. In fact, it's a matter of European law that uh, IT companies need to be able to explain why the systems that they own are making the decisions that they make. We don't know with AI systems based upon deep learning why they make the decisions they make. They are fundamentally mysterious. And we have never built machines before that are more complicated in some ways than we are and that elude our own understanding. And finally, these systems are fundamentally biased. They're biased because they are 
are built off the human data that our societies build, and our societies uh, embed various uh, prejudices uh, in their social structures. I I'll give you an example. Uh, Facebook has an AI algorithm that can reliably identify your face when you post it on Facebook. But it works very well for white people because Facebook trained its AI algorithm on large data sets based upon white people. The AI Facebook uh, face recognition program doesn't work nearly as well with people of color. I don't have a good solution for this except to suggest that engineers train their systems uh, on more diverse uh, data sets. But this is a fundamental, in the end, a, a political problem, uh, that we may want different outcomes from our systems than uh, the companies who are building them uh, are designing. Finally, a question which I get asked all the time is, which jobs are going to be eliminated in artificial, by artificial intelligence and machine learning? That's not an easy question. There are enormously varied answers. Uh, the McKinsey Global Institute believes that around half of current jobs will either be transformed or eliminated within 10 years. Uh, other firms like Boston Consultancy Group put the figure lower at 20%. Uh, if you asked me, I would say that almost any industry is going to be transformed by these techniques, but the likelihood of your job being eliminated, I think, uh, will depend upon two main vectors. The first vector is, is your industry producing an enormous amount of data? And the second vector is, is your job very repetitive and non-creative? And if that's the case, even if you're very highly paid, that's a job that's likely to go in the next few years. Uh, I was in a room recently, and a, a mother uh, whose uh, son was training to be a doctor asked if his job would be eliminated in a few, in a few years. And I said, well, what's his specialization? And she said, radiology, looking at patterns uh, in uh, uh, x-rays and in machine imaging. And I said, well, he's got a job for at least five years. That's a very repetitive job. But other jobs that require creativity, uh, I think, are going to be uh, largely untouched. And I, too, am a techno-optimist. I also believe that um, though new technologies always eliminate uh, jobs, they also create a whole variety of jobs that we haven't uh, even imagined. A uh, hundred years ago, more than 90% of the people who worked in Poland worked in the land or in some way in agriculture. And now that figure, I believe, is less than 10%. Um, economies are robust if they create new and profound opportunities, and they're sclerotic if they don't. So, I think, again, this is a political problem uh, that we have to talk through. Um, if we want to go and have a workforce that is capable of embracing the jobs of the future, it's up to us to train them. Because this is a revolution that is going to roil our society, whether we like it or not. I'm going to talk about nine other technologies with the time I have. I'm going to go through them fairly quickly. Again, in each case, I'll describe what the breakthrough is. I'll tell you why it matters. I'll tell you who the key players are. And I'll tell you how long you have to, to wait for them. Quantum computing is another technology that, again, was predicted for many decades, but which for a long time made very little progress. Last year, IBM had an incredible breakthrough where they simulated uh, something called a qubit, which is something like a bit in digital systems, except instead of being one thing or another thing on or off, a qubit can be mysteriously on and off and neither or both. And what this means is that quantum computers are massively parallel. 
They have the capacity to solve a certain range of problems that conventional computers could not solve with all the time in the universe. Uh, they are almost magical devices. Why does it matter? Well, the truth is we don't actually know yet. Uh, the hardest problem in mathematics is called the n equals np problem, and it's meant to describe whether or not uh, quantum computers uh, can solve everything, or if there is a category of problems that are in principle unsoluble. But I know at least some things that quantum computers will be able to do that ordinary computers can't. They can simulate quantum states. So quantum computers will be enormously powerful in my own industry of biotech, but also very powerful in material science and in chemistry. IBM, Google, and Harvard are the uh, main players there. This is happening right now. IBM has a product called Project Q. Uh, after you leave here, you can call it up online. Project Q is an online quantum computer where you can rent quantum computing uh, time directly from uh, IBM and play around with it as a programmer to see what you can do with it. Uh, Microsoft is also working on this project, as is uh, Google. I think sometime in the next two years, there will be practical quantum computing for businesses uh, in the room. How long it takes to be used broadly, that could take as long as, as 10. This is, the, this is the creepiest technology I'm going to talk to you about today. I, I don't know how I think about this, but um, people are working on this right now. Uh, last year, a Cambridge researcher took a stem cell, or a, a bit of flesh from a person's cheek, um, and then she re-engineered it to become a stem cell, that is a cell that can become any cell in the body, and then she coaxed it to enter the first stage of being a, an embryo. Now, now, that embryo could not have evolved into a full human being, even if it had been uh, embedded in a, a woman's womb. But we are extremely close to being able to create artificial embryos, and in the not too distant future, artificial eggs and, and sperm. Now, we're going to do this for really good reasons. 7% um, of men are infertile, 12% of women are infertile, and of course, um, women's uh, fertility hits a plateau in their late 30s. People will have a powerful desire to have healthy children. But remember I said that technologies have a power for both good and evil. I think this is a really disturbing technology at another level. Because we'll be gene editing uh, embryos and eggs and sperm, uh, we will be able to eliminate diseases in these eggs and sperm. And if a parent is given the choice of eliminating a monogenic, uh, that is a single gene disease, like cystic fibrosis, um, of course that parent will make that choice. I would, you would. But it's a fairly gray line between eliminating a lifelong incapacitating disease, say the, uh, the gene defect that makes women more likely to develop breast cancer, BRAC1, and augmenting a child to have uh, significant capacities. So we know the 1,400 genes that are involved in depression. Children who suffer depression have lifelong difficulties. But depression has been conserved. It has remained part of the human germline, our common genetic inheritance, for a reason. We don't know why the many, many genes exist in the human species. And in fact, genes can have late long-term um, faults and yet at the same time have important early life benefits. So you, most of you probably read that a Chinese scientist did this just the other day. 
He gene edited two embryos, and he conferred upon those embryos the resistance to HIV infection. And those children were born. They exist. They have names. They're living at this, in this very day uh, in Guangzhou, in China. But by eliminating the gene uh, that conferred a lifelong resistance to HIV, he also made those children profoundly susceptible to influenza infection. So I, I think of all the things I'm going to show you today, this is like a, an arms race that we are embarking upon with very little thought. We have no idea what most of the genes are doing uh, in our body. As I said earlier, biology is incredibly complex. Um, at the moment, there's a theoretical international moratorium on gene editing. But not only, not only is it going to happen, we know that people are breaking that moratorium right now. So as concerned citizens, though I think this technology has the capacity to eliminate disease, I also think it uh, has the capacity to allow us to play God in ways that I, I don't personally feel comfortable with. Uh, here is a uh, business application that for a manufacturing economy uh, like Poland, I think is uh, tremendously important. All my lifetime, uh, 3D printing has been the technology of the future, and it has never really been a practical technology where most things are made. So 3D printing has been really good for rapid prototyping, and it's been really good for uh, huge industrial applications like building a, uh, the blade of a wind turbine. But almost everything that human beings really value uh, is made out of metals uh, and is made in the vast middle of the uh, industrial world. And making small metal parts has been a really elusive problem. Uh, recently, a company called Desktop Metal, uh, funded by uh, Eli Sachs, who invented uh, 3D printing 35 years ago at MIT, uh, and another MIT professor called Yet Ming Chang founded a company called, uh, called Desktop Metal, as I said, uh, that has broken through this, this challenge. It's incredibly uh, important. Um, they are making metal parts uh, at, I think, 10 times less the cost of conventional metal fabrication methods and at 100 times faster than traditional 3D printing. But the really remarkable thing is that they can do uh, metal printing in a novel form that allows you to create metal parts that have never existed before. So um, I'll look these guys up. They have received billions of dollars in funding from companies like uh, Kleiner Perkins. I think 3D metal printing changes not just manufacturing, but changes a whole variety of other things as well. Supply chains, what we mean by factories. Uh, this will allow us to create a whole variety of machines that never, never existed before in history. The Internet of Things uh, is a interesting application. The Internet of Things is the idea that we can connect all the devices on Earth so they communicate with each other uh, rather than with human intervention. Um, it's the concept that you would embed sensors in the ordinary stuff of life. It would permit things like self-driving cars. It would create all sorts of new efficiencies. For me, the most interesting current application of the Internet of Things is a project in Toronto uh, called Waterfront by Alphabet's Sidewalk Labs. Uh, Alphabet is the parent company of Google. They are trying to create a modern smart city uh, in Waterfront. If it works, it will be launched in other cities as well, like San Francisco. Again, there are privacy concerns. Um, local advocates are saying, can we really trust Google to uh, collect all this data and not use it to sell advertising or for surveillance uh, on the population of Toronto? But if it works, uh, we could create a different type of city with far fewer cars, with more efficient use of energy, uh, buildings that were energy productive to the grid rather than energy consumptive. 
Uh, this is a really interesting project. They're meant to break ground this year if they get permission. This is the first real citywide application of the Internet of Things. Perfect online privacy. This is a breakthrough called Zero Knowledge Proof. Zero Knowledge Proof is a simple idea where I can reveal something that is extremely important, say that I am at least 18 years old, without simultaneously revealing online my actual date of birth. Uh, this would be a powerful breakthrough in the world of cybersecurity. It would eliminate many of these, uh, these hacking attacks that we hear about every day. This is available right now through a product called Zcash that is being used by JP Morgan. Uh, I think this is the breakthrough we've been looking for in online privacy. It is, at the moment, fairly processing intensive. Therefore, it's expensive and will initially probably be used by financial institutions, but I think it will be widely used uh, by anyone doing online commerce in the next few years. Blockchain for manufacturing. So I am not a big fan of Bitcoin as a technology. Bitcoin seems to me to be a kind of speculative mania. Uh, money has two main functions. It's both a store of value and a means of, uh, of transmitting value. Bitcoin doesn't do either very well. Uh, it's why it has these extraordinary ups and downs in value as people speculate on its value. But um, the underlying technology to Bitcoin, blockchain, is sublime and very important. Blockchain creates a digital ledger, a permanent database of every transaction that occurred in a long line from the invention of a digital product to uh, its current instance. It has very wide applications in agriculture, in trade. Uh, I see that Walmart at the moment is using blockchain in order to import safely pork from China and sell it in the United States. An application that I thought was very interesting in blockchain was using blockchain to make manufacturing more distributed. So a, uh, an online machine was hooked, hooked up to a small uh, blockchain network, uh, and it recorded in a trustworthy fashion exactly what manufacturing uh, function had been performed. If you could do this on a global level, you could imagine manufacturing parts around the world. And if you combine that with the technology that desktop metal is using, this could allow companies in Poland to contribute parts to devices assembled all over the world. Uh, I thought this was one of the most interesting applications of blockchain in recent years. This is the other technology which I think is a little spooky, which I wanted to talk to you about. Mary Lou Jepsen was the head of uh, devices and head of display for a number of important companies in Silicon Valley, including Facebook and Google. She was also the chief technology officer of One, lop one Laptop Per Child. She's working on a new company at the moment called Open Water that is creating a machine brain interface that can literally read your thoughts. Uh, and here's how it works. It sounds like science fiction, but it's not. Uh, the human body is transparent to red light. You can beam red light into the human body, uh, and then you can assemble a holographic image inside the body about what that red light is encountering. Now, this has interesting implications in medical devices. You could use these, uh, this holographic technology to replace MRIs, to create cheaper MRIs and CAT scans and PET scans. And that's going to be the initial business application of open water. But it turns out that the, um, the diameter of a human neuron, the resolution of a human neuron, is larger than red light. 
So in principle, open water can also read human thoughts. And whether or not that sounds science fiction, go online, uh, look at Mary Lou's company. She can put you inside a MRI scanner at the moment and show you a picture of an elephant or a jumbo jet. And then we can reliably see that you are, in fact, uh, creating the image of that elephant uh, or that jumbo jet in your head. So uh, this, this gives me pause uh, as well. Uh, there are a number of important applications that I would welcome from a machine brain interface. Uh, on the one hand, people who are paralyzed or locked in uh, could go and use a robotic arm. It could be used for a whole variety of other applications as well to control machines. But I, again, would be concerned with the privacy constraints of someone being able to read my thoughts. And if you could read my thoughts, in principle, you could also write them as well. Uh, I wrote an article about this for Wired recently. When I asked Mary Lou about the privacy concerns, she asked me not to worry about it. She said that this was something that we would work through as a society, as we thought about the applications. But Open Water is not the only company working in this space. Uh, Elon Musk, the founder of, uh, of Tesla, uh, also uh, has a uh, machine brain interface company. I think this is only a few years away. And though initially it will probably be used only in a medical context, we are not that far away from being able to control machines with our brains and potentially having our, our thoughts uh, readable as well by those machines. I think the, the civilizational challenge of our time is uh, global warming. Uh, and though, like Andre, I, I know that some portion of global warming is probably the result of exogenous factors uh, like sun cycles, I think most scientists now agree that a significant portion is the, the, the greenhouse gases that we are producing in our atmosphere. We have about 20 or 30 years to reduce our current energy system to uh, zero carbon emissions. That is a almost unimaginably uh, impossible task to achieve. And that's because we have more than 100 years of investment in a existing energy infrastructure and an energy infrastructure that is subsidized by many state governments and is supported by a global cartel. I'm confident that there are all sorts of trending lines in uh, storage, in batteries, in the cheapness of the generation of solar power, in novel nuclear energy systems that will get us to zero carbon at least sometime after 2050. But at the moment, we are continuing to simply add more carbon to the atmosphere. We're at around 415 parts per million uh, carbon in the atmosphere. It's going to go up even further. When I was a young man, I was told that the absolute maximum was 300 parts per mi million. I think this creates the, the worrying likelihood that the only way we're going to avoid large-scale changes to the climate will be to extract carbon from the atmosphere, to do a form of CO2 capture. This has been very expensive to date. Uh, there hasn't been an obvious way to do it. But there have been a number of breakthroughs in the last couple of years from companies like Carbon Engineering, Climeworks, Global Thermostat, that will extract the carbon from the atmosphere and then eventually use it for industrial purposes. This is a longer term project. It's going to take probably maybe five to 10 years to do. And I don't think it will happen without a policy signal from governments as well. We'll have to put some kind of price on carbon in order to uh, encourage this investment. But it's at least calming and comforting 
to me to know that there is at least a technological solution that would remove carbon. Because trust me, all the other forms of geoengineering that are being suggested, like spraying silica into the air, would have uh, profound and unknown effects upon the climate itself. This would allow us to at least reset the climate over the next 100 years. Um, very interesting technology. Uh, carbon engineering comes out of some very smart guys at the University of Harvard. And finally, I want to talk to you about a breakthrough in biotech. Of all the technologies that I showed you today, this is the only one that I am personally investing in. This is the microbiome and the virome. A uh, 100 years ago, uh, Louis Pasteur invented the infectious theory of disease. Pasteur believed that all human disease was the result of infection of the bacteria that crawl on our skins and uh, in our guts. Um, Pasteur said that all disease uh, evolved from uh, bacteria. And for 100 years, even as we learned that many diseases were genetic, uh, medicine was obsessed with the idea of disinfecting uh, the world. And it turns out that's completely wrong. Uh, some microbes, some bacteria, are bad for you and need to be eliminated. Uh, you don't want infectious bacteria uh, causing um, rashes or, uh, or, or rot. But around 9 tenths of the DNA that you are carrying around with you right now are healthy bacteria, which are essential for many of your biological functions. And that makes sense, right, because you evolved with these bacteria. One of the great breakthroughs in the last few years has been the understanding that bacteria are our friends, that they are a commensal part of our DNA. And at Flagship, we have begun to treat the microbiome, the bacteria you carry around with you, as an organ, like your heart or your brain or your lungs that can be drugged to treat a very wide range of illnesses. And I'll, I'll just give one example. It turns out that all autistic children uh, have a leaky gut because they have, a, uh, they have a dysbiosis. We don't quite know why, but their gut is leaking out all sorts of toxins into their bloodstream all the time. And those leaking toxins create learning disabilities uh, and create uh, emotional mood problems as well. We can go and cure the microbiota inside an autistic child's gut and significantly reduce their learning disabilities uh, and their emotional ups and downs. And wonderfully, it's not a toxic drug. It's not a chemical. You're simply restoring uh, their gut to its natural state. And there are a whole variety of other diseases in cancer, maybe even in dementia, that are correlated with a malfunctioning uh, gut microbiome. So we're heavily involved in this space. We think it's a really interesting area of biology. But it extends beyond human beings, too. Um, we have a company called Indigo. Uh, Indigo manipulates the microbiome outside seeds. And by doing that, we can increase the yields of uh, plants like wheat, soy, and rice by up to 75%. But crucially, we can also eliminate herbicides and pesticides, which increases the sustainability of farms and reduces the investment that farmers make. The next stage beyond the microbiome is beginning to think of the viruses in your body as something as well that we could use for medical purposes. Uh, much of gene therapy at the moment is trying to use viruses to deliver drugs, not very well. We think we have a breakthrough that could do it more effectively. Um, again, many of our uh, biological processes are dependent on viruses that have existed for 400 million years. Um, placentas won't develop without viruses. Even your mitochondria evolved from, uh, from viruses. So we think this is a powerful and interesting area 
of, uh, of future uh, life sciences. And we don't even have to go and create harmful chemicals to do it. Those are my 10 technologies for the year. Thank you very much. I'll be outside later. I will be very happy to answer questions. Let me just conclude by saying science is a absolute good. Discovering things, I believe, is the, is the greatest and most heroic thing that human beings can do. Learning about the world is the, is the greatest show on Earth that never ends. But technology is, is morally neutral. Technology is neither good nor bad. You can split the atom and you can destroy a city, or you can use it to create clean energy. With any significantly advanced technology, the technology has the power for, for good or evil. And it's really up to business leaders, like the people in the room, to have a conversation with themselves, with their consumers, uh, with their boards, about how they want to see technology evolve in the future. And as citizens as well, we need to ask ourselves what we want to do with technology rather than allowing technology to use us. And I note I say thank you very much. I look forward to talking to you all later.